Welcome. My name is Stephen. I'm the pastor at Hope City. We're delighted that you're tuning in to watch our online service. We would love for you to come and visit us in person. Uh, to do that, you need to register using the link below in the description. And if you'd like to find out more information about the church, you can sign up for our email. There's a link below for that, or you can check out our website, hopecity.co.za. Enjoy the service. Our Father and our, our King, uh, this is your truth, and we are needy people. We are people who need truth in our lives, uh, truth that transcends our circumstances, truth that transcends our feelings, truth that, that heals us and restores us and helps us. In your word, we have that. So speak to us this morning, Lord, by your Spirit, Open us to receive this truth and to receive it as a word that changes us. Make us new people, different people, as a result of what we hear. Make us like your son, as we see the pages of Scripture taught and opened up to us. Make us attentive now by the work of your Spirit, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, given the... Um, the temperature over this weekend, I can guarantee that there is some Dormany about 100 kilometers inland from Cape Town right now who's taken this opportunity to preach on hell this morning. Um, that's all we're doing. Uh, we're picking up our series that we were doing at the end of last year, and that is in the book of Exodus. Uh, we're kind of in the halfway point of the book of Exodus. So we've done a lot of the, 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 the famous narrative that you're all relatively familiar with, uh, if you've seen The Prince of Egypt or if you've read your Bible and been to Sunday school. Uh, we've seen that Israel were under slavery with an evil pharaoh, and that they called out to God, and God raises up Moses in miraculous circumstances. He sends him back, and he says, lead my people out. And through a series of plagues, the people of Israel are set free, and they they march out, but there's a, a hitch, and the hitch is that um, Pharaoh doesn't want to let them go. He is stubborn in his sinfulness right to the very end, and so he chases after them. And so you have this big, climatic, dramatic moment at the, the sea when the, Isra the Israelites cross over. God parts the sea. The Egyptians try to follow, and God covers the waters over the Egyptians, destroying the army and rescuing the Israelites. And so that's where we are now. We're on the other shore. The Israelites have crossed over on dry ground, and Pharaoh's armies have been destroyed. And so Moses and his sister Miriam break out into song. Moses sings a song of praise to God for the deliverance of the people. Miriam then leads the woman in singing what I think is actually the same song, although we just get an abbreviated form if you see at the bottom there of the chapter. And I say this is the halfway point of the book because thematically, the way that the song is structured, the first half of the song, verses 1 to 12, summarize basically what's happened up to this point in the story, and then the second half of the song look forward to Israel's ongoing journey towards the promised land. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to study this song together, this ancient song, and, and to help you get your mind around the big idea. So if you forget everything else that I say, the big idea over these next two weeks about what this song is trying to communicate to us uh, to help you get your minds around that, I want to tell you a little bit about what my kids and I get up to. Now, I am often trying to get my children to do adventurous, bold, exciting, risky things that I enjoy, and that I'm convinced, like, if you guys just try this, you will also enjoy it. Because I enjoy it, you must also enjoy it. Now, obviously, they're at the age where they're still kind of feeling out their comfort levels and figuring out how to take risks and be brave in certain instances. So for example, I've been trying to get them into surfing in the sea. And when we get down to the beach, I can already see them in their minds starting to uh, do a, sizing up the waves, do like a mental risk assessment of like, am I going out today or not? And sometimes I have to really, really strongly encourage them to, to be brave, to come out into the water, to paddle out a little bit further than they might be comfortable with normally going. Uh, one of the exercises that I do is all three of us will stand um, we were all comfortable, as far as we will all be comfortable. And then we'll let a little wave come and smash us, and we'll all stand, we're all still standing up there, say, okay, everyone, one step forward. And we take one step forward. And then we do it again, and we repeat the process over and over again. The next thing, they realize they're a lot further out, and they're much more comfortable than they were before. 
Now, I'm often trying to do this. I'm often trying to get my children to participate in these more adventurous, bold, risky activities, like surfing, uh, like at one stage it was playing with dogs, uh, hiking up mountains, uh, supporting Arsenal Football Club. All activities that require you to be very brave. And, and my general thought is this. If I can get them to take a risk in this activity, and they really enjoy it, then they'll trust me the next time I come along and say, hey, let's do this new harebrained thing. If I build up my track record of trust, it'll breed confidence in them, and they'll know I'm not leading them astray when I say, hey, kids, come and do this with Dad. They'll look at this new activity that I say, come and do it, and they'll go, you know what? Dad told us to do this other thing last time, and it was a real blast, so I'm sure this is going to be fun. You see, when someone builds up a good track record with us, that engenders trust in all of us, in that person going forward then into the future. And that's exactly what the Song of Moses is about. God's track record in the past and our ongoing confidence in him in the future as a result. Now, initially, I was actually going to do this all in one sermon, uh, looking back, verses 1 to 12, looking forward uh, but I spent so much time on the first point that I thought rather than make you sit all in the heat for a very, very long sermon, I'm going to do it over two weeks. So I don't really have much of an outline this week for those of you who like a nice, neat outline. This is basically just one long point looking back. So let's look at this together this morning. The, the, the first 12 verses of the song reflect back on what's just happened uh, the, during the crossing of the Red Sea. So have a look, for example, down at verse 1. It's almost a summary of the first 12 verses. It says, then Moses and the Israelites sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. So it's a praise song. Something like what we sang this morning. Praising God. Praising God for what? For taking down the Egyptians. Verse 3 and 4, uh, Moses describes God as a warrior who takes down Pharaoh's chariots and his armies, even his very best officers. That's his elite fighters and throws them all into the sea, drowns them in the sea. And then Moses turns a little bit further down, verse 6, and he reflects on God's power in shattering the enemy. So verse 6, your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. So this is a praise song to God for past tense, powerfully overcoming the enemies of the people of God. Now, I know particularly with our modern sensibilities, when we look at passages and we talk about God kind of smiting nations in the Old Testament, it can make us a little bit twitchy, like what exactly is going on here? But I think, and I, and I hope for all of us here, yeah, I think we saw enough in the first half of this series, uh, and if you haven't h heard any of that, it's all on the Hope City YouTube channel, you can catch it up there. But I think we saw enough in the first half of the series to know that these particular Egyptians are not very nice people. Uh, they, they were bent on enslaving and dehumanizing and oppressing the Israelites. They were a nation of incredible injustice. And, and God, uh, and, and during the plagues as well, remember, they were given plenty of opportunities to repent and to turn away. In fact, multiple, uh, by, 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 by most scholars' estimation, the plagues took place over the course of a year. So this is not like one opportunity to turn around. This is continual opportunities to repent. And so when we find God drowning the Egyptian army in the sea here, this is God rightly exercising his divine judgment, his divine justice, by consuming the Egyptian army. You'll actually find several songs and poems and psalms throughout the Old Testament that praise God for crushing the enemies of the people of God. There are even what we call the, um, the imprecatory psalms, in, 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 the, in the book of Psalms, and these are Psalms where the psalmist prays for God to mete out quite severe justice and judgment on his enemies. And there's a lot of debate today amongst Christians about how do we apply this to ourselves today as Christians? How do we take these, these images of God as a warrior beating down foreign nations and apply it to ourselves in, 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 our, in our modern world? We're not a nation state anymore like Israel, fighting idolatrous foreign nations who want to enslave us or crush us. These passages, I don't think, are justification for any sort of religious ethnic cleansing or war. In fact, Jesus explicitly says, in case you are confused at any point, 
He explicitly says in, in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to love our enemies. So what do we do then with these images of a warrior God crushing his enemies? Well, firstly, I think there are some situations where we should be praying for God to exercise his divine judgment on our enemies and, and praising God when that actually happens, when it comes to pass. So I think of a situation, for example, like North Korea. Christians in that country endure horrific, horrific persecution today. And I think it is appropriate that those Christians and other Christians join them in this, pray the imprecatory Psalms, for example, asking God to remove that evil regime and people who are unrepentant in that evil regime. And then should that evil regime fall and be crushed in their unrepentance, I think it is appropriate for those to rejoice, like Moses, that their warrior God has overcome their enemies. I think that's appropriate. And I don't actually think that's in contradiction to loving your enemies or serving them or praying for them or seeking their conversion. I, I think you can do both simultaneously. They're not at odds with each other. A committed Christian who is in a concentration camp simultaneously prays for the conversion and the well-being of his or her captors while also asking God and his justice to bring an end to that concentration camp. And there are people who are going to be unrepentant and are going to stick into the very end. That means bringing an end to them too. You see that, for example, in the life of someone like Corrie ten Boom, the Dutch Christian who hid Jews from the Nazi regime and then was found out and put in a concentration camp. So I think there's that dimension to the Old Testament image of God as a warrior crushing his enemies. But then I think there's also another spiritual layer to this. In Ephesians 6 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says these words to us, and I quote, he tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is, we have enemies that are not flesh and blood enemies. We have enemies like sin, like the devil, like death itself. In fact, you might argue that those are, in fact, our greatest enemies, and we need our warrior God to crush them for us. And he has. That's the point of the song. He has done that. Past tense. Looking back, God has definitively swallowed up and consumed our enemies. He has drowned them in the waters of judgment. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in a very similar letter to the letter of Ephesians in Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, these are amazing words. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So you were dead, Paul says. The shadow of death was an unavoidable reality hanging over you. And why did that shadow hang over you? Well, because of your sin, Paul says. You were trapped and you were enslaved in the clutches and the power of sin. And who else was your enemy in that passage? Well, Paul talks about these powers and these authorities, which is a kind of a technical term that he uses both in the book of Colossians and in the book of um, Ephesians to refer to spiritual forces in allegiance with the devil set up in opposition to God and his people. So there you see all three of our greatest enemies in that passage, sin, death, and the devil. But here's the good news of the gospel. In that same passage, God made us alive. That is, he beat death. God forgave us our sins. He canceled our legal debt that condemned us and enslaved us. And God made a public spectacle of the powers and the authorities. That is, he triumphed over the devil and his minions at the cross. That's where he did it all. That last word, at the cross. Last phrase. At the cross, death died. At the cross, sins were taken away. At the cross, the serpent was crushed. And so like Moses then, we can stand this morning and we can sing. Your right hand, Lord. Your right hand was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. But we don't sing it standing on the shore of the Red Sea, gazing 
upon the broken bodies of the Egyptians strewn along the sand. We sing it standing at the foot of the cross, gazing on the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how we look back. If you're a Christian this morning, if you've believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you've repented and turned away of a life in disobedience, and you've turned towards him and said, save me. If you're a Christian, God's warrior action on your behalf against your greatest enemies has already taken place. The battle's already been won. Powerful, powerful enemies that that beat you down, that harass you, that cause deep angst and and grief in your soul, those enemies, enemies have been decisively, decisively beaten. And so the question this morning for each of us is, what do we do with this information? How does looking back help us? How does it help you this morning? Well, I think the obvious application from this passage is that looking back should cause us to live lives of praise. First and foremost, praise to our victorious God rather than, I think, lives of fear and anxiety in the face of powerful yet defeated enemies. So Moses and Miriam, this is how they respond. They respond in praise. Verse 1, I will sing to the Lord for he's highly exalted. Verse 11, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Praise, worship, devotion, wonder, those are the marks of a person who is looking back and clearly seeing what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. The person who doesn't look back, they tend to regularly, at at kind of an emotional and an experiential level, get overwhelmed by the power of the enemy in their day-to-day lives. And listen, friends, the enemy is powerful. And it will produce deep fear and anxiety and a sense of hopelessness in your life. And look at verse 9, you see this. The enemy boasts, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. A lot of Christians today, I think, live in in the mental and the emotional shackles of the enemy's boasting, and and it's a debilitating and, and an exhausting experience. So take the enemy of sin, for example. You look at your ongoing struggles with sin. We we touched on this a little bit last week, and and all Christians struggle with sin. We should be fighting against sin and struggling to get rid of sin in our lives. But you you look at your ongoing struggles with sin in your life, your inadequacies, your failures, and you feel like the enemy's got you. He's got his grip around you. He's going to overtake you and destroy you, like the boasting says there. And the more you sin, the more you, you, you mess up, The more you you feel that, the more you sink into despair. You drown, really, in emotional despair. And the reason your your experience is one of drowning in sin is because often what you're doing, or or not doing, is is you're, you're failing to look back at the enemy of sin being drowned once and for all. You're drowning because you're forgetting about this other drowning. You're failing to look back and fix your eyes on Christ, fix your eyes on the cross where the enemy has already met his doom. And so the more you fail to look back, the more you fail then to have this song on your lips. Verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. You see this really well illustrated in the life of St. Augustine, the conversion of St. Augustine, really. So Augustine was a bishop in North Africa in the 4th century in a, in a place called Hippo. Uh, He's arguably the most influential theologian after Paul in the ancient world. In fact, when the Protestant Reformation came around more than a thousand years later, what they were really doing was recapturing a lot of Augustine's thinking and theology. But Augustine, as great a man as he was, like all Christians, wrestled with sin in very deep and profound ways. He particularly struggled with lust and with sexual sin. So for large parts of of his earlier life, he was very drawn to the teachings of Christ and to Christianity, but he felt himself under this this power of sin that he he couldn't get away from, and it tormented him. And so in describing his own conversion from this kind of nominal Christianity where he lived in a place of real despair over his inability to, to, to break the power of sexual sin, he wrote this in his famous work, The Confessions, He wrote, there was a small garden attached to the house where we lodged. I now find myself driven by the tumult in my breast to take refuge in this garden. 
where no one could interrupt that fierce struggle in which I was my own contestant. I was beside myself with madness that would bring me sanity. I was dying a death that would bring me life. I was frantic, overcome by violent anger with myself for not accepting your will and entering into your covenant. I tore my hair and hammered my forehead with my fists. I locked my fingers and hugged my knees. So you can see the way he writes here. This is, this is serious angst in his soul. Now, a little later, he writes this. He says, I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes. In my misery, I kept crying, how long shall I go on saying tomorrow, tomorrow? Why not now? Why not make an end of my ugly sins at this moment? And then he heard what he at the time thought was maybe some children playing a game. And he heard a child's voice saying this refrain over and over again. Take it and read. Take it and read. And he writes this. I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up, telling myself that this could only be a divine command to open my book of scripture and read the first passage of which my eyes should fall. So he got up, and he took out his Bible, and he opened his Bible to the first passage he might naturally come to, and he came to Romans chapter 13, verses 13 to 14. This is what Romans 13, verses 13 to 14 says. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Amazing. Here's what, here's what happened next. Here's what he wrote next. He said, I had no wish to read more and no need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. A penny dropped. The spiritual penny dropped that he didn't, as Romans said, have to live drowning in the despair of sexual sin. He could instead be clothed with Christ. In fact, and this is really interesting, the, the, the original Greek word there for being clothed in Christ is kind of a strange word, but it literally means to sink into Christ. So instead of drowning in sin, sink into Christ. Be absorbed into him. Let the waters of Christ's love cover over you. That is your strength. That is your defense. That is your salvation. Augustine, at that point, didn't suddenly just get a new superhuman willpower to resist sin when he converted. It's not what he got. That's not what looking back to the cross actually gives us. It's not that at that point he suddenly had more resolve than he ever had before. It's that at that point he had something more beautiful to look back to than he ever had before. Later in the Confessions, reflecting on this conversion, he writes this. He says, How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are true, the sovereign joy, you drove them from me and took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure, you who outshine all light, you who surpass all honor, O oh Lord my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. He uses the same language as Moses and Miriam on the shore there. My Lord, my salvation. So you can either spend your life like pre-conversion Augustine, in the garden, hammering your forehead with your fist, anxiously wrapped up in your sin, or you can live a life of praise like post-conversion Augustine, seeing God as, like he says, sweeter than all pleasure. The way to the life of praise is to constantly look back. Friends, I plead with you this morning, as believers in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, to constantly do that. To constantly look back at the sweet salvation of God because, here's the thing, you will not progress in the Christian life without that regular retrospection. Some of you are sinking right now. As you come in this morning and you come into this place, you're hoping for a word from the Lord or something or some sort of upliftment that is going to take you out of a pit of despair that you find yourself in because you're sinking right now, drowning in your struggle with sin or drowning in feelings of doubt or drowning with a sense of inadequacy. And you're exhausted. You're treading water. Over and over again, I just read, I don't know if you read about that man in Tonga who tread water for 27 hours after the tsunami. 
I cannot think of anything more exhausting. And you're exhausted. You're treading water, trying to resist this tide. And for many of you, the problem is not that you aren't swimming hard enough against the tide. It's that you aren't looking back in retrospection hard enough. If you don't keep looking back at Jesus on the cross, the enemies will loom large and they will beat you down over and over again. But when you look back, this is what you see. It's amazing. When you look back, you see that God completely and utterly dismantles these powerful enemies with nothing more than the breath of his nostrils. Did you see that in the passage? Those powerful, powerful enemies. Look at verse 8. See the wonder of our God. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. The, the seemingly unbreakable power of Egypt is destroyed in a moment by the breath of God. That's exactly the same for you and me. Exactly the same. Luke chapter 23 in the New Testament, verse 44. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The overwhelming power of sin and death and darkness is wiped away with the breath, the breath of God. If you don't constantly look back at Jesus breathing his last and sending sin and death and the devil himself into the depths of the waters of destruction, then you will spend your whole life getting bullied and broken down by those boastful enemies. You will spend your whole life treading water, desperate, exhausted, hopeless. You've got to look back and you've got to build everything into your life and your schedule and your patterns that you can to keep reinforcing that. Because those, 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 those enemies are going to keep boasting. They're going to keep getting in your face and boasting at you over and over every single day from sunup to sundown. And so if you don't come to church and look back, if you don't do private devotions and reading and look back, if you don't meet with other Christians and help each other to look back, you're going to get exhausted of treading that water. Look back, stand on that shore, like Moses and Miriam, look back and watch the praise well up in your heart. What God do we have like this? Who, who, which God is like this? He opens his mouth, breathes out, and the most powerful forces in this universe are dismantled. Let's pray together. Our Father and our King, we ask that in your great mercy you will help us as a church to look back at the gospel hope that we have in Jesus who breathed out his last on that cross and through that defeated the power of sin, the power of death, the power of the devil. Father, that is our hope, that is our joy this morning. It's the reason why we gather it's the reason why we are able to get up in the mornings and have meaning and purpose to our lives. It's the reason we're able to rebound and come back from hardship, from failure, from tragedy. It's just because we know there is a warrior God who has won the war for us. And we live in that victory. And so I pray that you will make us people of praise who demonstrate that we live in that victory, that praise would be on our lips, that praise would be in our hearts because we are constantly looking back and seeing what has been done for us. Father, help us as a church to help each other in this journey. It's not easy to always keep looking back because we're distracted by so many things. And so help us to keep 
encouraging each other to set our eyes in the right place. And Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who's never looked back that very first time, looked back to 2,000 years ago and that hill on Golgotha where Jesus Christ died for the sins of humanity. I pray if there are people sitting here this morning who don't have that as their story, who haven't repented and trusted in Christ, then you would bring about that faith in them this morning. Help us, Lord, to be a church that looks back. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.